We're continuing with the 35th chapter of A Little History of the World by E.H. Gombrich. We are learning about Napoleon, and we just heard about all of the city-states that he gave to members of his family and the letters that he would write to them, kind of disciplining them. And we continue. In Germany, too, the whole population was in a state of great agitation and indignation at the French, at the French emperor's willful brutality. And now that most of the German principalities were under French rule for the first time in their history, they sensed a common destiny. They weren't French, they were Germans. Who cared if the king of Prussia was on good terms with the king of Saxony or not, or if the king of Bavaria had allied himself with Napoleon's brother? The experience shared by all Germans, that of being dominated by foreigners, had given birth to a shared desire, to the wish to be free. For the first time in the whole of history, all German students and poets and peasants and noblemen joined forces against their rulers to liberate themselves. But it wasn't as easy as that. Napoleon was all-powerful. The great German poet Goethe said at the time, Shake your chains, and ha shake your chains how you may. The man is too great for you. And indeed, for a long time, no amount of inspiration or heroism could match the might of Napoleon. What finally brought him down was his insatiable ambition, the power he had already he had already never seemed to be enough the power he had already never seemed to be enough for him to him it was only the beginning and now it was russia's turn the russians defied his command not to trade with the british and for this they had to be punished napoleon assembled troops from every region of his vast empire until he had an army of some 600,000 men just think of it, more than half a million human beings, one of the largest armies the world had ever seen. And now, in 1812, this army marched on Russia. As the soldiers penetrated deeper and deeper into the heartland, they met with no resistance. When they advanced, the Russians retreated, just as they had done before the troops of Charles XII of Sweden. At last, outside the gates of Moscow, the mighty Russian army stopped. Napoleon attacked and seemed to be victorious. I almost said, of course, for him winning battles was the same as solving puzzles. If you, ha if you are someone who is good at that sort of thing, he would note the enemy's position and know immediately where to place his own troops in order to evade or attack them. So he marched into Moscow, only to find the city almost empty and most of its inhabitants fled. It was late autumn. Napoleon inst installed himself in the Kremlin, the ancient imperial castle, and waited to dictate his terms. Then news came that the suburbs of Moscow were burning. In those days, most of Moscow's houses were made of wood, and as the fire spread, large parts of the city were engulfed in flames. The Russians had probably started the fires to put pressure on the French. All efforts to extinguish them were in vain. What could, where could 600,000 men stay with Moscow burnt? And how, could they not, and how could they be fed? Napoleon had no choice but to retreat. In the meantime, however, winter had arrived, and it was bitterly cold. Everything in sight along their route had already been plundered and consumed. The retreat across the endless frozen wastes of the Russian plains would now become something too terrible to describe. Overcome by cold and starvation, more and more soldiers fell by the wayside. Horses perished in, the th in their thousands. The Russian Cossacks rode up and attacked the rear flanks of the army. The soldiers fought with desperation, surrounded by Cossacks, and in the midst of a raging snowstorm, they managed to cross the great Bresnia, Bresnia River. But little by little, their strength ebbed away, and they lost hope. Fewer than one in twenty of the soldiers survived this terrible defeat and reached the German frontier. In the last stages of sickness and exhaustion, disguised as a peasant, Napoleon abandoned his troops and hurried back to Paris on a sledge. His first act was to raise fresh troops, and now that his strength was reduced, there were rebellions everywhere. Yet once again he succeeded in raising a mighty army, this time made up entirely of young men. These were the last men left in France whom Napoleon now sent to combat the subject peoples. He marched on Germany. The Emperor of Austria sent his Chancellor Metternich as a, to negotiate peace. Metternich talked with Napoleon for a whole day. And what if this army of boys that you have raised is mown down? At these words, Napoleon turned first white and then purple with rage. You are no soldier, he shouted. You know nothing of a soldier's heart. I was raised on the battlefield, and a man such as I doesn't give a fig for a million lives. With this outburst, so Metternich 
related, Napoleon hurled his hat across the room. Metternich left the hat where it lay and said calmly, Why should I be the only person to hear this within the privacy of these four walls? Open the doors so that your words may resound from one end of France to the other. Napoleon rejected the terms of the Emperor's Peace Treaty, telling Metternich he didn't have any choice. If he wished to remain the Emperor if he wished to remain Emperor of France, he would have to fight and win. In eighteen thirteen a battle took place in Leipzig at Leipzig in Germany between Napoleon's army and those of his allied enemies. On the first day Napoleon had the upper hand, but then on the second he was suddenly abandoned by the Bavarian troops who were fighting for him. He lost the battle and was forced to retreat. During this retreat he fought with another large army of Bavarians, which was pursuing him, after which he returned to Paris. He had been right. Following his defeat, the French deposed him. He was given sovereignty over the little island of Elba, to which he retired. However, the princes and the emperor who had brought who had brought his defeat met in Vienna in 1814 to, go, to negotiate with one another and share out Europe among themselves. It was their opinion that the Enlightenment had been a disaster for Europe. The idea of liberty in particular was responsible for all the disturbances in the country and the countless victims both of the revolution and the Napoleon and of Napoleon's wars. They wanted to undo the whole revolution. Metternich in particular was determined that everything should be as it had been before and that no similar upheaval should ever be allowed to happen again. It was therefore vital, or so he thought, that nothing should be written or printed in Austria without the approval of the government of the Emperor of the government and the Emperor. <coughs> in France the revolution was totally extinguished. The brother of Louis the Sixteenth came to the throne as Louis the Eighteenth. The title of Louis the Seventeenth having been given to the son of Louis the Sixteenth, who died during the Revolution. The new Louis ruled with his court in France with the same pomp and the same lack of judgment as his, as his unhappy brother, just as if the twenty-six years of revolution and empire had never taken place. The French became increasingly discontented. When Napoleon heard about this, he secretly left Elba in 1815 and landed in France, accompanied by a small number of soldiers. Louis sent an army to fight him, but as soon as the soldiers saw Napoleon, they deserted and went over to his side, and were joined by soldiers from other garrisons. After a few days' march, the Emperor Napoleon entered Paris in triumph, and King Louis the Eighteenth fled. The princes, still conferring in Vienna, were furious and declared Napoleon to be the enemy of humanity. Under the command of the English Duke of Wellington, an army largely made up of British and German soldiers was assembled in Belgium. Napoleon attacked without delay. A savage battle followed in 1815 at a place named Waterloo. Once again, Napoleon seemed at first to be winning. However, one of his generals misunderstood the order he had been given and led his troops in the wrong direction. Toward evening, the commander of the Prussian troops, General Blucher, gathered together his exhausted men, and with the words, it looks pretty hopeless, but we mustn't give in, led them back into battle. It was to be Napoleon's last defeat. He fled with his army. He fled with his army, was once again deposed, and forced to leave France. He embarked on a British ship, placing himself voluntarily in the hands of his oldest enemies, the only ones he had never beaten. He was counting on their magnanimous on their magnanim magnanimity, and said that he wished to live as a private citizen under English law. But in his life, Napoleon himself had rarely shown any magna magnanimity. Instead, the British declared him a prisoner of war and sent him to a tiny, uninhabited island far out in the Atlantic, known as the island of St. Helena, so that he might never come back again. There he spent the last six years of his life, abandoned and powerless, Dictating the memoirs of the deeds, dictating the memories of all his deeds and victories, and quarreling with the English governor, who wouldn't even let him take a walk on his own around the island. And that was the end of the little man with the pale complexion, whose strength of will and clarity of mind were greater than those of any ruler before him. Meanwhile, the great powers of the past, those ancient and pious princely houses, once again ruled Europe, and the austere and unyielding Metternich who would not stoop to pick up Napoleon's hat, guided the destinies of Europe from Vienna through his emissaries as if the revolution had never taken place. And that is the end of chapter 35.